Hello everybody, John Fulford here. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Happy New Year, January 2021. 2020 is over and 2021 is just beginning. Funny, I remember, and I have proof, January 1st, 2020, I saw an article about a mystery pneumonia that gripped China. And I screenshotted it and I sent it to my friend out there because I was planning on going there. And I said, should I wait till this kind of blows over? And he said, ah, you should be fine. Just wear a mask. That was January 1st, 2020, over a year ago. So anyway, this episode is about what you could do, what I'm planning on doing, you know, what you would think about doing in 2021 as it relates to your music business. A lot of the stuff I'm referencing, I probably said a bunch of times before, but I'm going to I'm going to congeal it if you will with new things and how you could apply it to 2021 specifically. So if you hear me going going on some sort of uh explanations, I'm not saying rant, I don't like that word. Some sort of explanation. I don't like a lot of words, right? There's a lot of words I don't like. If you hear me going on an explanation about something that you've heard me explain before, just it it's going to come full circle on how you could apply it in 20 21. My people that do production music, especially for reality shows. Okay, listen, reality shows were in a Michael. What's a Michael? A Michael Buble, a bubble. 2012 is no longer with us. 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, what I think the golden age of cable reality TV where a unexperienced, nascent music producer, I'm not saying composer. If you're not doing it to picture, you're probably not a composer, okay? Production music producer could earn a great living as a function of the time they put into it. Those days are no longer with us. It evolves. Pop culture evolves. People that were watching TV shows on cable are now watching things on Snapchat, on TikTok. All right? You see what I'm saying? So that that was a snapshot, a picture in time. It went up. And it went down. Will it still be? Will it still exist in some form or fashion? Of course, of course. But back in those days, when Duck Dynasty and Kardashians were revved up, raring to go, they needed a ton of music on pretty much a weekly basis. Obviously, there there wasn't a new episode every week of every year, but they needed music on a pretty much a weekly basis. Hundreds of new. Uh, not new, but hundreds of music placements per episode. If not in the hundreds, close to it. I I would bet that some of those episodes had more than 100 unique pieces of music used, more, more than a few times, okay? So they needed a lot, a lot, a lot of music. And speaking of Duck Dynasty and Kardashian specifically, they had spinoffs. Duck Dynasty had at least one spinoff that I could think of, Jep and Jess, and Kardashians had, oh boy, a lot. I, I have to hit pause and try to count up how many spinoffs. So, which I don't want to do. But there's a lot of spinoffs. Okay. So, they needed music. So, music business people, mostly in LA, but also in New York and other cities, you know, around the country and, and the world at large, saw that there were gaps that these shows needed to be filled. So, they started libraries with no money up front, no money to pay. And they attracted composers, composers, producers, that many of them had lucrative, lucrative, lucrative day jobs in other facets of life, but were talented musicians, okay? They were talented musicians, but they didn't know how to meet deadlines. Yeah, I, I could go, you, you heard me say this before, right? But for a while there, they were able to do music in their home studios on the weekends, send it out to these libraries, and get placements, so before it was how to attract ARs. Oh, I wrote a song or I want to be an artist. How do I get an ARs attention? Then it became how can I get a library's attention? And for the libraries, it became how can I get a music supervisor's attention? So for a while, these production companies that did these reality shows, if you called them and said, Hey, I have a lot of great music, it's fully cleared. I have, you know, I put out music every month, and you had some modicum of street cred, you could get pretty what became pretty lucrative deals, you know, earning some money year after year after year because it was a bubble, okay? I'm not even talking, I'm not even going to count all the sports programming and all the daytime stuff 
right? That That's just in addition to these primetime cable reality shows. Okay? It was a bubble. That was before Snapchat started putting out shows, like legit shows. That was before TikTok even existed. And that was before Netflix and, uh, you know, Hulu. I mean, those were just kind of like... I remember, like, some people in L.A. knew what Hulu was, but people in South Florida didn't, like, what, Hula Hooping? They didn't know what Hulu is, right? Or Netflix was the DVD company that had a few movies and a few TV properties streaming, right? Now they're doing new content. They're doing new, I'm working on a show right now. It's a TV show on Amazon, and it never, it was never at cable and then went to Amazon. It just, it, it birthed, if you will, on Amazon, okay? So how do you apply that to what you're doing? Well, if you're willing to do music as your livelihood full-time, you, I, I mean, I think, in my professional opinion, you will not be any worse off than you were in 2020 and in 2019 because a lot of these and, and again, when I say these, it, it's kind of like a pejorative, like these people. I'm not trying to disrespect anybody in any form or fashion, but you got to realize there's different, people have different motivations. So when you're looking at people that they might teach music, they might be professional live musicians, they might be just working at a job, nothing to do with music, do music for fun, which I think everybody should do music for fun, really. And I think everybody should have a podcast. Even if you don't upload it, just jabbering into a microphone, it, it, it could do you a lot of good. And then just don't put it up. Everyone should do music and have instruments and everything like that. But these cats, you it's going to be harder to make a part-time living. Okay? Because there's not as many shows going around that are on TV and things like that. A lot of companies are paring down the, the libraries they work with, you know, th things like that. So let me give you a for instance. Back in 2012, 2013, 2014, you would go to a music conference and you would see a g -g 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 gaggle of people walking around saying they produce music for reality shows. And then you get to talking to them and then, you know, they might only work three, four, five hours a week doing music, but they were making well into six figures at their day job. And when you would say, oh, can you do some music for me? They would get excited and say yes and then bail on you because they had to go to on vacation or they had to – they're moving into a new house. And, you know, things are kind of crazy right now. We're just closing a new house, so we have to sell our old – like things that for a professional composer is just life. You know, you won't even – like if you hired a professional music composer to do your project and they were moving into a new house, you wouldn't even – you wouldn't even hear, like, oh, I did that. I did the, uh, I did some work um, on a film a few years ago when I was moving into a, um, a new house. And it was like literally no, it was no factor for, to, to borrow a phrase from Jocko Willink, right? It, it just, I just did it. I was renting an apartment, working on something, started renting a house in Van Nuys, and, that, and no one even knew about it. You just move your stuff, right? So, there's a lot of people walking around these conferences that were over-promising and under-delivering, okay? A lot, a lot. So if you could promise and deliver, I'm not talking about under-promising and over-delivering. If you could just deliver what you promise, you will be in a great spot on working with these libraries. You will set yourself apart, and this is assuming your music is great because a lot of these cats had great music too. That's why they would, that's why they, people would say, hey, do some music for me. They, yes, 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 sure, sure. And then they bail on everybody. You know, so if you could just promise and deliver, promise and deliver, you will set yourself apart from everyone else who has great music, but their intention is just for, to do music as a fun hobby, which is great, but not when you start, uh, you know, contacting real like properties, like shows and music libraries and things like that, okay? The bubble created that. The bubble created that. And now the bubble has popped, and I think a lot of those people are, you know, 
going to quote unquote retire from production music or, you know, things like that. So you're in good shape if you just promise and deliver. Promise and deliver. Okay, what's next? Direct licensing is here to stay. Okay, in years and decades past, only a select few TV networks did direct licensing. I don't want to mention which networks do it. It's pretty much common knowledge on the internet. Just look it up. If I say it and someone listens to this in six months, those networks could be doing PRO licensing and, you know, then I'm given wrong information. Just look it up. A couple of networks are, do, are doing direct licensing. Uh, pretty well known about a year ago, Discovery Networks try to move to 100% direct licensing format and everybody went crazy. But no one saw what the deal was. I was one of the only people that said, wait, Discovery wants to move to direct licensing. Well, what are they offering? People didn't even want to hear it. And not to, uh, not to harangue Mrs. McAllister over there at the, at the, at the PM, PMA, but they put out a whole dossier on why it's bad to direct license when all those PMA libraries were direct licensing. It's not that they wanted people not to direct license. They just wanted you not to direct license. Don't do that while all those libraries have been doing it for years and decades. Okay? Years and decades. They just didn't want you. They didn't want the competition, frankly, to start to try to negotiate deals. But now, there's a point to this, but now... The PMA on my Twitter feed tweeted me saying that their official position is that they have no position on direct licensing. That's basically what they said. If you dig back in my Twitter feed, you could find it. But that's the gist of what they said. Why? It's because it's so it's so big and prevalent now that they like, why are you gonna say no? You know, it's here. It's here, it's here, it's here. Now. Our company is going to try to take advantage of that to the composer's expense or the producer's expense, the library's expense? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But direct licensing is, <laughs> it's very, it's a lot easier for you to negotiate a direct license than it is for you to try to lobby for a bigger share of the performance pie. Okay. And I'm going to give you all an example. Say you have a piece of music. And you license it to CBS for $2,000. And then you get a check from your PRO for how much? You don't know. I don't know. Right? I don't know. Or you go to Netflix and you license a track to them for $2,000. And they could say, all right, look, we'll either run this through the PROs or we'll give you $500 now. We're going to prepay all the performance royalties right now for 500 bucks. Well, how much would my PRO be? I, I don't know. I mean, it could be $80. It could be $800. And it's going to take nine months at least to come in. And then we don't know when the next payments will come in, if ever. Will you take the 500 or will you roll the dice? It could be 80 or It could be $8. It could be nothing. Or $800. Depends, right? Depends what kind of project that is. But since you have the option to do that, it gives you the option, right? I've made more money on on my Breaking Bad placement. I've made more money through Netflix on my PRO than I did on AMC. Okay? So... That that would factor into my decision if I had another Netflix placement. But how long did that take? My my Breaking Bad aired seven years ago. Almost eight years ago. Wait, no. Ten. Like ten years ago. Breaking Bad ended seven years ago. My so it took ten years for my Netflix income to to supersede my AMC. Because someone is always watching Breaking Bad. They're homesick from work or they're corona quarantined, self-isolated. They, they don't have a job right now or whatever. They're watching Breaking Bad on Netflix. 
But if it's a reality show, not a lot of people are going to turn on Netflix and watch Cycle 32, Episode 5 of some reality show. You see what I'm saying? Because there's just it, reality shows like hot content. Like it comes out and then it goes. It comes and goes. But Breaking Bad is more high-brow, high-art type TV. You see what I'm saying? But if it's a show like uh, Runaways on Hulu, that I did not direct license that, and I got like I got a pretty cool um, ASCAP check from that from Hulu or was it BMI? It was one I forgot what uh, what uh, what what song it was, but it, that was pretty cool. Like I got I got the check. I was like, what's that? Oh, geez, nice. So these are all things to factor into your decision. It's it's never cut and dry. You have to look at each specific placement differently. So say in, in a month, you get two Netflix licenses. One, you might be staunchly willing to direct license. The other, you will be staunchly willing to PRO license. It all depends. You have to look it over. And if you don't have experience enough to look that over, which many people don't, I know I do, I'm learning stuff every day about direct licensing. Like I'm over quoting and they're saying, well, you know, that, that, that might be too much money. You got to talk to the library and also make sure your library cuts you in on the direct licensing on the few direct licensing deals that I've done for songs that I didn't write a hundred percent of. I pay the other writers, even though I bought the tracks, I still pay them a cut of the direct license because they will get that money anyway through the PROs. But since I'm direct licensing, I'm just not going to keep that money. You got to divvy it up. Okay, here's the publisher share. That's my share of the direct license, and it was written by four people or whatever. So you, you divvy it up and you send them the money for it. And you just say, hey, this was for a direct license. A lot of times, uh, if I have a chance, I email all the writers and say, hey, you're getting a placement on this show. It's not coming through BMI or ASCAP or or uh, CSAC. I'm doing a direct license, so you're gonna get a check for X amount and. They appreciate that because I could say you're getting a check for X amount and you're getting it as soon as it, as soon as the deal closes instead of waiting nine months to a year and not knowing what you get. So all that said, direct licensing is here to stay. Last year when Discovery tried to do it, um, the PMA put out a whole thing. I think it's still on their website, which is informative. It just says all the reasons why not to direct license, which is good because a lot of things you're not going to want to direct license. So go, if it's still on the website, download it, read it over, read it through, but just realize that all the libraries have been direct licensing for years and years and decades. Okay. So if a library tells you, oh, direct licensing is bad, say, well, wait a minute. Don't you direct license and watch them tap dance like uh, Shirley Temple. Was she a tap dancer? Well, 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 when it makes sense, well, you know, uh, all that double talk, okay? And when you're talking to libraries, say, hey, look, do you pay a share of the direct license? And if they say no, because it, it is an accounting, you know, it, it does take a lot of accounting if, if a big library starts direct licensing, okay? Say, oh, you don't? Okay, well, I'm going to, let, let, let me charge you an extra 25% per track then, and then you don't have to worry about the direct licensing. So you could do that or you could pass on the deal or, you know, you could just take the deal for what it is. You know, it, it, decide for yourself, in other words. Don't let anyone else decide for you. You know, like when Discovery was moving to direct license, there was all this news what they were going to do because some library heard from Discovery that they were going to do X, Y, Z. Well, let me hear from Discovery what the deal is. And no, no one had any information straight from them. Okay, so if someone's going to direct license, get the information straight from the licensee, not from your buddy's music library because, you know, it's distorted. You know, what if Discovery was going to do all this stuff, but then they were going to pay a premium on it? Or what if they weren't? What if they were not going to pay a premium on it? Which is, you know, I don't want to say what I thought they were going to do, but, you know, I still like to see it for myself, right? So long story long, direct licensing is here to stay. I have some videos um, of it on my YouTube channel. Oh, which leads me to my next point, our Amazon affiliate link. Link in the description if you're watching this on YouTube or listening to it on YouTube. Link in the description if you are listening to this through Apple Podcast. Click on the Amazon affiliate link. Buy whatever stuff you're going to buy anyway. 
your tablecloth, your chairs, your guitars, your lamps. We get a cut of Amazon's profit, but you don't pay anything extra. It doesn't cost you any more money. Some people have been buying music, music equipment. Why is it hard for me to say that? Music equipment? And I couldn't be happier. You know, they're, they're buying stuff through Amazon. They buy anyway, and, you know, we get a little cut of the action to help the channel to buy more equipment and stuff like that and keep things going. I'm going to try to hire some people here to help me work on some stuff, and I don't want to use my music library money because that's for the uh, that's for the composers. and oh, the, Why do I keep saying composer? For the producers. And that leads me to my next thing. Many libraries I've spoken with and that have spoken to me are paring down their operations as a function of the amount of content that they are submitting to. What does that mean? Well, reality shows needed a lot, a lot, a lot of music. So, you know, there were times where I was putting out 10 to 20 albums a month to keep up with these shows, right? But now there's less pure reality content on TV. So there's no need to do 10 or 20 albums a month, maybe three or four, okay? Three, four, five albums a month. And I would have a few core people and then a g -g -g gaggle of part-timers that it, it was a real pain to work with because they all had something better to do than do music, right? They all had something better to do than do music, even if they were doing music. Um, I'm working on an artist project right now, so like, I'm not going to have that music. Well, dude, you're supposed to send it to me like an hour ago. Yeah, well, I'm working on this artist project right now. It's going to be an experiential art piece, some sort of audio visual. Let me tell you, they didn't submit music that they were supposed to do for me, and their little art piece never went anywhere, okay? Because they're, cause they're part time like stoner cats, you know? So that will be pared down. That will be pared down, and that's actually beneficial to the, the people that work with me on a daily and weekly basis because they're gonna their work is going to be the same. Or maybe it'll go down a little bit. Maybe it'll go up a, a good amount. Okay. And now since Corona has been here for like a year, a lot of production companies are starting to adapt and ask for music again, which is, which is good. All right. But a lot of these part-timers, what I'm saying, like they're, they're not going to be in the mix anymore, and that's going to help – the full timers, and I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about like the guys with lucrative or the guys and women. Sorry, with lucrative day jobs. I'm talking about like the younger cats that oh do music on TV. Yeah, man, like that need money. That need money, and then like one guy even said, I uh, I can't handle. I was like, hey, want to work on this thing for Universal Production Music? And he and he got intimidated. He's like, oh, I, I can't handle that. It's too much of a. A burden because it's universal. He got nervous and and wouldn't do anything, right? But now I I and other libraries won't even have to try to work with those cats because we're gonna go to our core people who have been working for years and they turn stuff in on time and like that's cool. So there's gonna be more work I think for those cats and a lot less work for the. I hate to say wishy-washy. I, I hope, you know, I'm trying not to insult these people. I don't want to get another hey man email, but there's just not going to be work for them. So think, because things are paring down. I don't, like, I don't need another album of dubstep. Future Bass Volume 86 and Tension Beds Volume 39.5. No one needs that. And if and when, again, they do, and they make the phone call, hey, we got a new show coming out. We really need some new tension. Great, I'm going to go to the people that have been doing tension for me for years and not have to go to other people that I haven't worked with or I've only worked with sporadically or I know they're going to flake. So I have to like talk to five of them and have five people saying they're going to send me stuff just to get uh, enough music that one dedicated person could do. You see what I'm saying? That what one dedicated person could do. All right, so... That that was my next my next point. And I hope that sinks in. I know I've said it before in a number of different ways, but now it's 2021. We got a whole year to see if this goes, you know, see if this comes to fruition. You know, which I'm which I'm excited about. Another point. Another point. Decentralization of content. 
just like Bitcoin, decentralization, the currency, just like people moving out of the big entertainment cities, decentralization of the entertainment population. That rhymes. I didn't, I didn't think it would rhyme, but it rhymes. That's really cool. I didn't plan that. What does that mean? Way back in the day, okay, you had like two TV channels and the cinema and sheet music and jukeboxes. Like back in those days. Right? Then you had TV, DVDs, live, uh, what was it? Not live, cinema, you know, movies. But now you have video games, you have YouTube, you have TV, you have Netflix, which you watch on your TV, you had you had Quibi. Which, you know, that, that's a whole different story, but they were licensing music on Quibi before it went under. And in the future, you're going to have more things like that. So what does that mean? That means that there are people right now making millions of dollars a year doing content that you have never heard of. Every couple of weeks, I stumble upon some YouTube channel or some TikToker that's making a really, really great celebrity level living that you have never heard of. It's decentralized. And that's one of the reasons why Quibi kind of didn't do so well is because they went after like these big, uh, you know, Reese Witherspoon and these other uh, big, uh, what's the guy, uh, the lady, Chrissy Teigen and other big stars, right? Well, they could have went after a Mr. Beast. And I was showing Mr. Beast to an older relative who's been talking about starting a YouTube channel for like 10 years now, never going to do it. But it's the camera and all the equipment and stuff. And I'm like, look, you could wait until you have your lighting rig and all this crap you say you need. But look at Mr. Beast with what, like 40 or 50 million subscribers. Contrast that with like how many people watch cable when some cable shows, well-known cable shows, only get like half a million uh, views when in like their first airing, like the primetime flagship airing. They get like half a million views. When there's YouTubers getting 10 times that for a video they put out about, you know, whatever they're doing. So it's decentralization of content. So what does that mean for you? If you do music and you like, you know, you're also a plumber. Let's just say that you're a plumber and you do music. Why don't you hit up the top 20 plumbing channels on YouTube? Hey, I'm a fellow plumber. I do music. Uh, If you give me... A hundred bucks a year, I'll send you all the music I do that you could use for free on YouTube. Right? Or give me five bucks every time you use a, a cue I send you. And that's direct. You're going direct to the source, to that YouTube channel. And that includes a direct performance license, you know, you no know, ad rev share or anything like that. See what I'm saying? It's decentralized. So you could hit somebody up that has a million YouTube subscribers but still worries about how to get cleared music. And I've spoken, I, I know some lucrative like YouTube channels that are lucrative for the owners and their day jobs are lucrative. And what do they need? I said, how can I help you? They're, oh, music. I need music. We got dinged with this ad rev thing so we used three seconds of this track that we downloaded uh, that was on some website we thought was clear, but they stole the track from someone else and it's not, okay, cool. Well, how much is that worth to you? Like, why don't you, all right, pay X amount of dollars and I'll give you a login to my website and you could use every piece of music and if you ever want to stop and not pay, that music won't be ad revved. So it's, it's not retroactive. You don't have to keep paying a subscription to use the stuff you've already used. That's decentralization. Back in the day, what happened? You wrote a script, you had a project, and then you had a big meeting, right, with the suits. Remember that? Oh, the suits. We're going up to the to the 17th floor to meet with the suits. And those people could either greenlight your project or they could pass on it, right? People in South Florida would work so hard at doing things, and somehow they knew someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew someone that got them a meeting in New York. And they... They wore their nice clothes. I know I've seen it happen when I was like in high school and stuff, right? Oh, they had a you know, they had a meeting with NBC. They had a meeting with NBC. Oh my gosh! But now it's decentralized. You could just do stuff yourself. 
You could do music. You could do content yourself. It's decentralized, and that is very scary for a lot of people. People I know, they like that regimentation. You do your project. You go to the the people on the 17th floor. They green light it. You get a check, and then you work on it. That That's a very linear progression, right? Like Think of it not starting strength linear progression for those of you that know. If you know, you know. Anyway. That linear progression, think of a basketball player. They play in elementary school, they play in middle school, they play in high school, and if they're a really, really great world-beating athlete, they skip college, go right to the NBA. Or, for most basketball players that make it in the NBA, they go to college. They play basketball in college, then they enter the NBA draft, and then they get drafted, and they go play in the NBA. Right? That, that now, that's not, that's... You got to look at the NBA players and go backwards. You don't you don't look at every middle school basketball player and say they're going to go in the NBA, but you look at the NBA players and say, "Okay, what did you do before the NBA? College. What did you do before college basketball? High school basketball." What see backwards. So, back in the day, you would look at someone making a million dollars a year with content what did you do before this? Oh, well, I had a meeting with these people at this network. What did you do before that? Oh, well, I made like a really great demo reel and I was an assistant director on a couple commercials. Oh, what did you do before that? Oh, I went to Full Sail in Orlando and I learned da-da-da, right? Linear. But now there's people making really, really good livings talking into a webcam from their living room about, you know, speaker design or farming or G.I. Well, I don't know about G.I. Joe's, but the probably is. Look up G.I. Joe history on youtube and there's probably a channel that goes in depth and that's a lot that's also what gary vaynerchuk says in his videos is that like if you if you have something you want to talk about and you make enough content you can earn a living at it that wasn't possible 15 years ago okay now it's possible so there's trade-offs so am i worried that there was a reality show bubble? A little bit, yeah. I mean, I'd like to see, I like, uh, yeah, of course. I'd like to keep seeing that. It, w- it was a good, it was a good business, you know? But am I hopeful for the future? Yes. Heck yeah. And then there's also the, re- uh, the surgence of neighboring rights. That is a performance-based royalty, if I, if, if I understand it right. Right, get it? No pun intended a performance-based royalty on the master recording that goes to the label owner and the performers or the artists of the piece of music. And up until the last couple of years, there weren't any companies that were going after these rights on behalf of American citizens because it is more difficult to collect for American citizens because... America did not sign some declaration, or we signed one declaration back in the day, a very important one, but some sort of, I think it was the Rome Convention or something, like a reciprocity agreement with other countries. So some countries don't pay Americans neighboring rights, some do. So it's a lot more complicated, a lot more complex. But recently there are companies that have started that go after these rights for Americans, okay? Uh, a couple of them charge ridiculously high commission rates, and some of them charge more uh, industry standard commission rates, and you know they, they go after them for you. So if you're if you've been composing or producing music for music libraries and production music and things like that for the last few years, you could have some neighboring rights floating around out there. I know some people uh, that focus or their music gets used in certain countries. Their neighboring rights checks are a lot bigger than other people's checks that are focused on some other countries. And that's just a function of where these shows get aired. For instance, if you do a bunch of music for Duck Dynasty, your international checks might not be great because who in France is going to understand Duck Dynasty, right? But if you do a a show like, um, like pick a show, like a French show, for instance, then your French royalties should be pretty good because it's airing in france a lot more than duck dynasty it doesn't translate duck dynasty doesn't translate well but it chapter two or some big blockbuster movie should do well because it, it appeals to a worldwide audience right like harry potter 
Paul Lolita is great internationally, right? Because it, it has that worldwide appeal as opposed to like a Kardashians or a Duck Dynasty or something like that. Teen Mom. Well, they have a Teen Mom. They have a special Teen Mom, or they did at least, in Europe that's separate from the Teen Mom here in America, right? So you got to look at it like that. So you could have a lot of placements and sign up for neighboring rights and not get a lot, or you could have very few placements, but they're the right types of placements to generate neighboring rights. So I am hopeful on neighboring rights. That looks like it's kind of coming into its own in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there, uh, you know, happy with their neighboring rights checks, and it's something that I, I look forward to. I, I look forward to a couple times a year. So uh, yeah, so that that that's almost uh, that's almost the episode here. I hope y'all had a uh, had a good listening experience. I know people that uh, have commented on internet forums that it sounds like I'm rambling. If you don't know me, well, maybe get to know me and I won't be rambling. And if I am rambling, my rambles are well thought out. Okay, I don't have a teleprompter here, people. I'm doing this. I, I have a little I have a little piece of paper that I write stuff down on when I think of it. And then I speak it into the microphone for everybody to be involved with the community. So if you want to be involved in the community, music licensing podcast at gmail.com. That's music. Licensing podcast, all one word, music licensing podcast at gmail.com. Amazon affiliate link in the description. John Fulford Music, Cool Chords Volume 1, free sound pack. Link in the description, completely free. It's royalty free. I don't need your email address, or, although it would be nice if you email me and say if you're using it. If you like the pack, Hit that Amazon affiliate link and buy buy something you'd buy anyway so we get a piece of the action. I did the chord pack myself. I've been using it. A lot of the sounds I've been uh, I've been using, um, like I've gotten some cuts out in Asia with the same sounds and styles that I put into this chord pack. All right, It's a working chord pack for working musicians that want to land placements and that want to land artist cuts. Okay, so that's it for today. Keep writing, keep producing, email me anytime, and I'll talk to you soon.